Hello and welcome. I hope everyone is enjoying their day. I have to tell you guys it is 97 degrees here today in Northern Nevada, which it doesn't usually get this hot this quickly here, but uh, like usually never before uh, June 1st. Uh, I mean, but our weather is crazy here. I've seen snow on the 4th of July in Northern Nevada, so you just never know. I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit. It's a little crazy right now. Let me just, there we go. Okay, sorry about that guys. I've had some technical difficulties before I started, but I hope you guys are enjoying some nice weather. I actually, ironically love this weather. 97, but I love it. So say hello as you're popping on. I see Vicki and Colleen are here, which are both members. Guys, I will be on our membership call at five o'clock. So I hope you guys can make it today. But um, I'm going to start with just introducing myself for those of you who are new. My name is Evelyn Knight and I am the owner of Child Care Business Professionals. We are a company that helps business owners find success while balancing high quality standards. Hi Vicki, how are you? And hi Beth, I see you there and Colleen is there. Hello ladies. Um, so that my goal is really just to help centers just find that success, success and achieve the success. And I help them just put those pillars in place that I've learned through my career as a child care center owner. And for those of you who've been watching me for a while, you know, I own a center. I just rushed home from my center because I forgot some of my stuff here today. So I just actually came home, but I, and so I know what it's like. I am a business coach that is there too. I've been a director. I've done every job within my child care center. So I know what it's like to be an owner, director and everything. So I can take that experience and I'm currently in the business too. So through this COVID crisis, as I'm coaching my clients, I'm going through everything with them. We're actually going through all of this together and kind of just inventing things as we go, right? So it's really been helpful and nice, I think, uh, to have that collaboration. One of the great things too, I think about the membership is uh, we meet twice a week via Zoom. One of the days I teach on something, uh, you know, just to help strengthen your business policies and practices. And then the next day I actually will, um, go through and, or which is Thursdays, actually today, right after this, we're going to have our membership call. I have like an open office time. And during my open office time, my members can just ask me questions. So uh, basically for an hour, I'm logged on to Zoom. You have the opportunity to jump on and just pick my brain. Uh, you know, if you have an issue you're dealing with or any kind of obstacles that you're running into, you can just jump on, ask me questions we try and work together through it. I have a big surprise coming from my members, which we're going to be announcing Monday, which I'm so excited about. And if you are one of my members, you know I've talked to you guys about my vision, my overall vision for my membership group and how eventually every day of the week, we are gonna have some kind of expert on that will be available to coach you through something, right? Well. I, my announcement that I have for you guys on Monday will be actually announcing the first person that I have on that will be coming on weekly in order to help coach you guys. So we're going to be adding a third day to our membership. So not only Tuesdays and Thursdays, but uh, I believe it was Wednesday we were talking about, but I will have somebody else who is going to be available every week to just help train and coach you guys. So that's going to be an added benefit to our coaching program and our membership group that I'm really, really excited about. And we will be announcing that here live on Monday. So, um, and if you're interested in becoming a member of our group, let me know. I am going to be doing some consultation calls. I will be scheduling. I know I've got a couple of you guys who've messaged me. I will message you back today. I had some stuff come up in my child care center um, and my 16 year old. So um, I will let you guys know. So there's a few of you that I need to get on the schedule that have already messaged me that they want to have a time to chat. So tomorrow um, I am pretty open for consultations. So if anybody wants a consultation, let me know. You can tell me in the chat or just send me a message and I will uh, get 
figure out a time to meet with you guys tomorrow. I'm pretty open and Saturday, my husband works Saturday, so he works from home, but still, I don't mind. I usually work Saturdays also. So between tomorrow and Saturday, I'll definitely have time for anybody who wants to chat and have a consultation about joining our membership group. So today, I'm just going to jump right in and I will, I promise you guys I wouldn't go over today like I did yesterday. I love talking about team building. It is something we train on. Um, we're we're going to be starting soon in our uh, membership group. We're going to be starting the to go through like the whole team building process. And we will be starting from the get-go. I'm going to take you guys through in detail my recruiting to my uh, interview process to the new hire training and the future onboarding and then what we do for every employee year after year after year to make sure that we have that strong relationship and that great employee retention that my center has been known for. Uh, it's interesting. I actually um, had, we are a QRIS state and uh, I had an official ask me to train on employee retention at our annual NACI conference that's here in Nevada, our Nevada NACI conference. So it was something I was doing, but then our conference got canceled due to COVID, which I was just heartbroken. So it is like um, just, you know, around, I mean, you guys know retention is crazy. So I was actually going to train on it. And, uh, but that is actually a training that comes from, with my membership that we will be doing in the upcoming weeks. So, I hope you guys have your homework with you and you've been keeping up on the workbook. It's, uh, you know, it's something that you can hold on to for years to come, refer back to it, just go through it later and just make sure that you have that focus aligned, right? It is a really brief overview, but it can help you really to start you on a roadmap to success and it will really, really help you to stay focused. So make sure you're going through that. Uh, there's a lot that we'll be talking about today and everything just really ties into itself, right? So our first pillar, of course, was on vision. And um, as you know, every single day, hi, Elizabeth, how are you? Every day we've been coming back to that vision and how it plays into every piece of this puzzle and every part of your center success. So the next day we talked about your culture and your brand and how being intentional about creating that culture based on your vision is really going to help you with that reputation that you have and the persona that you put out into the world, right? It's a very, very important piece on letting people know who your center is and just that reputation that you end up building. I gave you guys the example of McDonald's. If I say I'm loving it, Everybody knows who I'm talking about, right? They've just got such a strong, powerful brand. And then a company like Starbucks, who you know what their company culture is. Chick-fil-A is another great example. They are just known for their culture. They're just known for having such an amazing culture to work for. And their customer base is very loyal and they've got an amazing following, right? And that's all very intentional. Very, very intentional on their culture piece. They have a department that is dedicated to making sure they keep up with that wonderful culture that they've established. So um, yesterday we talked about your dream team, how to create it, how to lead it, how to manage it, right? And again, your dream team, once you know your vision, you figure out those values that are so key in order to have that vision come to life and to know what your culture is, then you're hiring people based on that value and based on the fact that they can buy into your vision. So you're no longer, you know, throwing meatballs at the wall and hoping one sticks. You're being more intentional. And also I talked a little bit about recruiting. So instead of waiting for people to come apply for jobs, when you see people out in the world that fit your vision and your model, try and bring them in. If you've got a customer that's a stay at home mom, but she just seems to get it, you know, she's her children just, they, it, she personifies what your vision and your mission is. Ask her if she wants a job, start her out at, you know, four hours a week, whatever you need to. As her children get older, she's going to want to take on more hours. And at the same time, you're going to want to empower her, right? You're going to want to help her grow as a woman on her own. 
I'll tell you guys one time when, before I opened my center, I was a stay at home mom and I'm going to grab my water really quick. You guys, sorry, 97 degrees. I am so dry, but, um, as a stay at home mom, I, at one point before I had opened my first center, um, I worked as, at a center as an infant toddler director and I had done some other stuff for a corporation and then I became a stay at home mom for a while. And I just remember one day going to my oldest son's school and uh, my boys are five years apart. So I had an infant and a kindergartner. And um, then I, I can't think he was in the first grade though. I went to his school and I just remember everybody was like, hi Bro Bronson's mom, hi Bronson's mom. And you know, the teachers, everybody referred to me as Bronson's mom. Then um, I went to my husband's work and everybody oh hi Ronnie's wife hi you know and just it was and it just kind of started bothering me everywhere I went I was either Bronson's mom or Ronnie's wife and I didn't seem to have my own identity and that really started to bother me so ironically I signed up to sell Avon and I ended up building a huge Avon organization with over a hundred recruits underneath me and ironically i built my avon organization so big that it was a big way that we funded our my first center but it was really did i have a passion for avon no i didn't i just needed my own identity right i needed something for me that wasn't i i had to be something more than just Bronson's mom and Ronnie's wife. Not that being Bronson's mom isn't awesome and amazing. I love being Bronson's and Ronan's mom. They are some amazing boys that I'm so proud of. But I just, I need to sing for myself. And I see, you know, this so much. And that's what we really need to be aware and conscious of, right? In ourselves that, um, and look around at your moms that are coming in. How many of them are in that position? One of the things I actually require my staff, I require my staff to learn mom's names because that was so impactful for me. Just, you know, even the teachers and everybody at Bronson School calling me Bronson's mom all the time. It was so impactful for me that now I actually make my staff learn their names. They have their own identity. Don't call them mom, dad, you know, like call them by their names. But that being said, that's where like, you may think that these ladies aren't looking or stay home dads. I don't discount them either. But um, you may think, hi Sue, that they may not be looking for a job, but you might be surprised. You know, they, they might be interested in working and um, they might be in the position I was in where I just needed something for me. And those ladies become some of the most stellar employees that you will ever have. I have quite a few of them at my center still and I just really, mentor them, grow them, and nurture them, put them through CDA. Some of them have gone through the TEACH program to get their associate's degree. I've even had some of them get their bachelor's degree. Um, not a lot, only maybe one or two to be honest. Usually they stop around their associates, but it helps them to empower them. And when you empower your staff and you show them that you believe in them, they really stick with you and they work so hard for your center. They become a part, and when they have that, buy into your vision too. That's very important. So those are just really, really important components to establishing that dream team. Um, so today though, we are going to talk about one of my next favorite things, which is um, structure and procedures. And I have always been just one of those, I'm just that type of person where, you know, um, I tease my family in the kitchen. Nobody can clean it but me because I should be able to go in the pitch black and cook a meal. I could literally just know where everything is in the total darkness and cook a full meal. So that's just how I've always been. But as a business owner, I wasn't always that way. I didn't understand how to have procedures. I didn't even know what they really were, right? I had an employee handbook and I had a parent handbook, but those are not policies and procedures. And so many owners that I'm working with, they think they have policies and procedures, but they don't. What you actually have is an employee handbook or a parent manual, right? They are not the same thing, not at all. If you have your employee handbook that talks about like clocking in and clocking out or about vacation days or your childcare policy and procedure or your drug and alcohol policy, 
time off to vote, things like that. That is just an employee handbook. And if you guys, and if you don't even have that, you've got to get one because it, it's like federal law. You have to have one. So I actually just started working with a client that does not have an employee handbook and it blew my mind. Like you've got to have an employee handbook. Cannot stress how important that is. So, but the employee handbook is going to have all those basics like taking time off, um, you know, just have paydays, stuff like that. Policies and procedures are going to spell out exactly how you expect everything to be done in the classroom, right? So like for me, my policies and procedures are going through in detail. What is my discipline policy? What is my behavior policy? How do I expect my staff to handle all these different situations, right? My, um, and, and a lot of different things, not just that. How is nap time to be conducted? How is our cleaning schedule done every day? This is all in writing. It's all in my policies and procedures and manual, and we just have them throughout the building in different contexts. But um, we even go so far as in how do you speak to the children? And I'll give you kind of a funny example that people always think is nuts, but I'll explain why. Um, my staff is not allowed to say don't, stop, or no. And the reason is, because so often you hear staff members just saying, stop that, don't, no, right? And that's it. So it used to drive me nuts. And it was it's not developmentally appropriate, by the way, to do that. Um, I do not like things like no thank you, because if you look at it from a neurological perspective, right, which you guys know, I'm that's my, my degree is in neuro, neurological psychology, so that's always one of my focuses. If you look at it from a neurological perspective, children learn like through a why right and if you're just telling them no all the time they don't understand they need that deeper foundation as to why hi liza you can actually chime in on this one so the reason that we don't allow do we don't say things like no stop don't is because we're really just like commanding and the children aren't learning anything and one of the things i explained to my teachers is the children that we're working from with, they are so new to the world, right? They're so new to, they don't, people are not born understanding social norms. It is our job to teach them how to be social beings, right? If you look at culture in general, culturally, the social norms we expect out of children are not the same around the entire world, but we expect them to just be born knowing this stuff, which is not the case. It is our job to teach it. So if we're just telling them no all the time, then um, if we don't, if we're just constantly saying no and stop, we're not teaching them anything. So by eliminating those words from my teacher's vocabulary, it's forced them to explain things. Like they will say something like, please don't um, climb on the tables because you may get hurt, you may fall and get hurt, right? So it's that constant explaining, constant conversation that really amazingly help with your interactions too. So Liza says, children do not understand negation until about, yes, absolutely. And Liza is um, an expert on this. She's actually my sister. And she knows like, you know, just, she's actually a speech pathologist, but really understands that developmental piece. And it's um, amazing that, you know, just what our job is, is to teach these children. It's, it's how to be social beings, right? Because they are not, born. Yes, exactly. We say chairs are for sitting. And one of the things, just an easy summary I tell my teachers is think about it this way. You're always explaining yourself constantly, all day long, every day. So if you're just yelling things like, don't do that, what are they learning? What are you accomplishing? And that's another thing I teach all the time too, is I'll ask them, um, you know, what are you accomplishing by actually saying something like that? But I just, went down a rabbit hole and got off on a tangent. and But that is an example of some of my policies and procedures. I actually have an entire page in my policy and procedure manual and an entire day of my new hire training dedicated to this subject, right? This is just an example, just one day that is totally dedicated on how do you speak to children. That's it. And Liza, I should actually send that to you for proofreading to see if I'm missing anything on that, just to make sure that we're hitting all the targets and I might actually end up having to expand on that training. But 
it's so very important to have a policy and procedure for everything. I mean, we have a procedure for diaper changing, you guys, just to make sure you're staying consistent. And I know that seems like overkill, but think about it. How many teachers, you know, if you've been in business for a long time, whether you've been an owner, director, or a teacher, I'm sure you have ran into that situation where somebody didn't know how to change diapers. They don't know how to wipe properly. And now the baby has a rash because they weren't wiped properly, right? So we created a procedure for it. And it really, really helps. Things like biting. There are solutions. Is it rough? Yeah. Controlling biting, we know that it is so hard. But we have a really solid system in place that works. And so it is a procedure. If we have a biter, both of our parents and our staff member have to sign off on it. And we follow the same procedure every single time. So in a lot of centers, and even ones that I've worked for in the past, it's kind of like every time a problem arises, you're trying this, you're trying that, but there's no permanent solution. So the teachers are constantly just fighting to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to fix this issue, right? So when you have constant these policies and procedures, you know that the things that you're accomplishing are being done exactly the same way every time. And you know that it's being done the way you want it to be done, right? And so even when it comes to like, I mean, you guys, we do, we do it even when, yes, it really empowers employees. Mis, uh, exactly. There's no miscommunication about what's expected. You're setting them up for success. Your expectations are always very, very clear. It's the same thing for parents, though. You got to do it on both ends. Like, you know, a lot of times we expect parents just to know, right? but we don't remember that we're in this every single day. We go through this. They have no other precedence for this. So they don't just know. It is our job to teach them. So when I went on this, this journey was, uh, I didn't even realize how important this stuff was until I hired my own business coach. And she really got me on this journey uh, and she taught me what I'm talking to you about today. And she helped me come up with my policies and procedures in a more general business sense. And then what I've done at this point is just taken that and really turn them into childcare specific procedures. And what she really did was more managerial, right? When it came to the managerial side, I have just flown with that and taken it into the classroom. And it's not as hard um, as you guys might think. There's, I've got some systems to make it a lot easier to create these policies, procedures, and systems and more, you know, and also the training behind the policies, procedures, and systems, but, and then the coaching. Coaching is key, right? But I've also um, helped other owners, directors establish their own. It took me years, and, it, and they're always ongoing, right? I mean, I think you guys with this COVID crisis understand and know that now we had to just come up with new policies, procedures, and it's all new, right? So, it's taken me years. So part of my coaching program is my philosophy on it is if I've already done it, why reinvent the wheel? Might as well use what I've already done. That's pretty much how I look at it. Just take what I have, format it for your center. And we work together on just kind of creating that, explain it, teach it and how, why they work and why they are so important. So it really has helped to streamline. The other thing and the other reason it's so important to have solid policies and procedures and systems is something that we do not think about a whole lot. And um, another coach that I work with is the one who really taught me this method. And she basically asked one day in a group coaching call, like, what do you guys want to do with your businesses 20, 30, 40 years from now, right? And it's not something we think about a lot. And she was on her, in her teaching, she was telling us about how most small business owners end up having just to close down when it's time to retire. And they are, they just lose their business basically. Either they never get to retire and they're there until the day they die or they shut it down and they lose their business. And the reason for that is because um, they don't have systems in place. They don't have policies, they don't have procedures. So their system is not duplicatable. It can't happen without them. So what ends up happening is the business crumbles when they're gone. And uh, let's see, Elizabeth asks, how big is your handbook? How do you make all the policies not daunting to read? So that is a great question. So my, I actually have three handbooks for my employees, not just one. 
I have my employee handbook, which is all the legal basic stuff that I was talking about earlier, the time off to vote, how many vacation days they get, what most companies have, right? Just the very basic handbook. Then I have my policies and procedures manual, and then I have my new hire training manual. So the way that I make this not so daunting is I don't, um, I, that's, I've taken my policy and procedures manual and integrated it into my new hire training manual. That is part of the reason my new hire training is 30. It, so my, the intense part is every day for 30 days, right? And remember it is integrated into every day. So you don't have to worry about pulling your, these people out of the classroom for 30 days. They are working in the classroom. I've just integrated it into their everyday work life. Okay. So every day for 30 days, they are training on my policy and procedure manual. They're never going to read it. You guys, I, at first I just wrote it, expect everybody to read it. It's not going to happen. They're not going to do it. So my new hire training guides them through it. It literally will go section by section and it guides them through it. So it breaks it down into smaller, more achievable steps. So after that first 30 days, we go into a more of like a weekly training series that's a little bit different. Uh, some of the things we've done to help, like I was talking to you guys about yesterday too, is I do have video snippets that we've recorded that it, the teachers do watch. And so there are specific days that they may be out of the classroom for 30 minutes to an hour, maybe once or twice a week to watch some of these videos. And I'm sorry guys, my cat is just, he's kind of being, um, fussy right now. So one of the things that um, we do with these videos is I've taken my teachers that are like just a really, really super good at something or, um, and sometimes what we do too is we just record the classrooms and if we notice stuff or sometimes we're intentional and if we notice something that was really great, we'll take that tidbit and turn it into part of our new hire training. And these videos are not long. I mean, they might be two minutes long. They might be 30 seconds long or they may be a half an hour, right? And um, it's just a great way for us to uh, help incorporate that so they can see it. One of the things I've learned over time is I can train all I want, talking to people, doing it like this, but nothing is a better trainer than them getting to see what it looks like, right? So when I talk to you guys and tell you that to my staff isn't allowed to say no, don't, whatever in the classroom, that's kind of hard to picture and understand, isn't it? But if I go and I record maybe a 10, 15 minute session in my classroom that shows you how my teachers deal with that, it suddenly becomes way easier to picture and understand. And then it's just like, oh, okay, I get it, I see. So that's where the video comes in. And the video does not have to be hard. It doesn't have to be a big um, production. I literally take my phone, record, upload it to my computer, and save it. I actually did buy my center a GoPro recently, uh, recently, like a year ago. And so now Brandy will record videos in the classroom a lot of times, just set the camera up and record. And, uh, and she does that, uses that too for observation purposes. But it's not, it's the easiest way really to get it done. And, um, but yeah, that's basically the new hire training is really how we make sure that it's not so daunting because it could be. I mean, when I first just gave them all the paperwork, it is a lot, a lot of paperwork. I just kind of um, had to realize, like I had to have a reality check and that they're not going to read. I wouldn't, I wouldn't read it if I was an employee, right? So why would I expect them to? So that's pretty much how we make sure it doesn't get too overwhelming and daunting. Um, so that's pretty much uh, what, you know, to, to think about. But again, think about your future, like getting back to on that track. Think about your future and what do you want from your center when you're ready to retire? You know, when you're between 60 and 70, you're going to get to that point. No matter how much we're in love with our centers now, one of these days we are going to want to retire. Will somebody be able to come in and buy your center from you? And could it just run fine without you? Think about that. Do you have the systems and, and still maintain the brand that you've created, right? This is what systems and procedures do for you. It makes sure that you don't have to always be there. 
So if you're an owner who works more than the normal, or a director too, who has to be at work for more than 40 hours a week, it's because you do not have strong policies and procedures in place, or because you're very controlling, <laughs> which I was there once. I was at that point once where I just couldn't leave my center, even though they're fine without me. Um, so that's what is really, really important to understand is that we don't need, you know, the, and if you're an owner who wants that, like just to kind of get control of your life, if your center is owning and controlling you, like my center once did to me, you, that means that you don't have strong enough systems, policies, procedures, and training. So yes. 60, 70, um, 55, yeah, Sue. That's And that's why, Sue, our next module, we're going to be working on creating those policies and procedures for your teachers so that we can free you up. So get you back down to like a normal, reasonable schedule, 40 hours a week. But it basically takes what you do and you make yourself duplicatable, right? The other thing that that helps with is when you're ready to open your next center, which I know if you're a single center owner, so, and you're struggling with all of this, the thought of opening two centers can seem insane, right? It can just seem overwhelming and insane. But when you have those documented systems in place and you have that solid training, you it, it's not so bad. It isn't that bad, right? And now you can duplicate yourself and your team. Everybody needs to make sure they are duplicatable, right? And that way you can you know, expand on your dream. And right now your dream might be just to take control of your center, but once you get control of your center and you can duplicate it, your dream may become to own five or six centers, right? So that's another big thing. And then when you have that system in place and you're ready to retire, you can sell your center or you can, you know, give it to family. You know, you can make it an inheritance, but the bottom line is, is that the business will survive without you. It'll be just fine. The other thing that is really important to note, you guys, is I've told you guys uh, earlier on about how in 2012 I got really sick and I checked out, right? Well, during that time, my business fell apart, right? It was like, I actually got sick in 2011. They diagnosed me in 2012. So everything just fell apart and crumbled around me because I wasn't there. I just wasn't there. But now, last year, um, for those of you who've been watching me for a while, you know, my husband had, uh, he has end stage kidney disease. He started dialysis and he actually had three strokes between December and January. And there was a time where it got really, really, really scary. And now he's doing awesome, amazing. You would never even, it's just the craziest thing that, I mean, he has some residual effects, but it, it the turnaround is just insane. And thank God for the turnaround. But during that time, there was a moment that I was in the hospital with him and, and he was in the hospital for a long time. It was almost about a month. Um, and I just, I sat back and thought about like the difference, right? And I really looked at like, you know, in 2012 when I got sick and uh, in 2011, 12 when I got sick and all this was happening, everything fell apart because I wasn't there. Now, at the point I am in my business, it's fine because I have such strong policies and procedures. I was able to just be gone. Hi, Heather. I was able to check out, be gone from my center, and everything flowed just fine without me. It was just fine. So the contrast between the disaster that happened during the, you know, when I got sick in 2011 and 12, and how it made my business just almost completely fall apart to what I just went through between December and January. And I was gone, I mean, I would go in maybe once a week to check on my girls for like two hours, you guys. I was going to my center for like two hours a week at that point in December, January. I was pretty much gone for that two month period because um, I also became, when my husband was finally released, I was his caregiver at home. I was like his in-home nurse and I couldn't leave him. So that was such a huge contrast in that my center for work so just fine. And that is because I now have a really solid system and I have very solid business organizations and procedures that are in place to make sure everything works like clockwork, whether I'm there or not. So that is the difference. And that is something that I just want you guys to really, really think about because you may be 20 years away from retiring, right? You may be 30 years away from retiring, but you don't know 
what kind of disaster is going to hit your life tomorrow, right? You have no idea. I had no idea. My husband is only 47 years old. I had no idea he was going to have three strokes in December. So yes, and absolutely, it's all stuff. But it's because I find so my you know, and and I think a lot of times we underestimate our staff. I think most people are pretty solid, but because we as leaders don't have those policies, systems, procedures, organization, and all of that, and we're just chaos a lot of times, which I absolutely was absolute chaos at the time. We cause our staff to be the way they are, right? So I hear so many owners who are disappointed in their staff, but they don't understand that starts with us as leaders. Now, there are some staff, absolutely, you can have the best systems and everything in the world, they're still gonna not be great, but as you grow as a leader, it's gonna trickle down. Director, assistant, more, yes. So with my director, like I was the director for a long time, and then basically my director now, I, I, had, I really just had to learn how to duplicate myself, right? And that's pretty much what I ended up doing in my director. And it did, and, and I can tell you, she's been with me for 11 years. It wasn't always sunshines and roses, with, right? And, and for the first few years, I didn't realize that I needed to teach her and learn, duplicate myself. So I wasn't really intentional about that. When I started to realize that, that I had to duplicate myself, I can't be the only one to do this stuff. Because sometimes, you guys, we don't know what's going to happen. To, you know, you can get in a car accident tomorrow, and then what's going to happen to your center, right? So when I started becoming intentional about teaching her to and to become, to take my role on, right? Because she's never going to be me. She's different. She's got her own gifts that I need to let her fly with. But when I learned that I needed to start teaching her, and then I started putting policies and procedures in place. I put a really, really detailed uh, job description with a detailed calendar and also just really taught her, like, this is our vision, right? This is my queen bee. And I've talked to you guys about my queen bee role, that everything revolves around the queen bee, right? And so we talk about it all the time. And sometimes now she'll come back to me and just say, hey, that really, you know, there's things, that, decisions that I'm making or things I'm doing that she'll come to me and say, hey, that is not protecting our queen. And we're, I'm just like, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's not protecting the queen, which, you know, my center is the queen bee. Quali high quality standards is the queen bee role. Okay, so everything has to revolve around that and protect the queen bee. And so that's when I realized, like, I have to have these systems. I have to be duplicatable. And the only way you're gonna be duplicatable is with organization and systems. Gotta have them in place, right? And the same thing for the parents. If you really want that consistency, every single time you have a billing issue you have you know just a parent arguing with you about something you got to have those systems that every single time it's the same procedures so and and you guys it takes so much stress off your staff when they know exactly what to do every time exactly what is expected of them and even if they don't know they can go look it up because it's documented somewhere right and um and sometimes new things come up right? I like this COVID thing. And if you've been with me for a while and you guys know, or if you've been through the COVID unit in the Facebook page, you know that I put out there for everybody. I shared my, uh, an outline of my um, strategic plan for dealing with COVID-19, which honestly, it's just a fancy way of saying this is my procedures on how we're going to deal with it, right? So you're going to hit areas where okay i need to come up with a procedure for that but you become like you get to the point where when you're used to it you become so good you just shoot them out like that so like if you guys see that outline you created it took me maybe 30 minutes to create that outline because i'm so used to doing it now now my actual plan so the way i do it is i create the outline first and then come up with a plan my plan took me a little bit longer and then i sent it to my lawyer for approval and different things like that which, um, by the way, I, I, there's actually quite a few of my members on it. my members that is the, the plan that I gave you guys is my actual, like my entire plan, which as you know, we've had to change, right? Because the CDC keeps changing things. Everything keeps changing on us. So there are times that we're going to have to be on our toes and we are going to have to change things up a little bit. But for the most part, that stuff that you deal with day in and day out and you're constantly dealing with, there is no reason to have a solid procedure that happens the same way every single time, 
right? Potty training, where we have a policy and procedure for potty training that our parents have to sign off on. There should be policies for everything, especially those things that you deal with all the time. Call-ins, um, staff arriving late for work, different things, those little irritating things. If you just have something in line that every single time you do the same thing, it's always uh, consistent. Your staff also gets to know that. And if they don't want to deal with that consequence, guess what? That stuff stops. You suddenly get control of all of that because they know exactly their expectations, exactly how you're going to deal with it, and exactly what's going to happen if this is what they do. So it really does help in so many ways, you guys. Um, so one of the things, too, that one of the ways I like to explain this to you is think of your center as a bucket right and if there's a hole in your bucket everything's going to constantly spill out right so you're constantly losing parents and children are constantly leaving the center and you've got high employee turnover and that way to plug the hole in that bucket is honestly with good solid policies and procedures and that consistency it's the consistency that helps you to achieve your culture that you want, right? That's what's gonna get you to that culture. It's gonna help you achieve your vision and it's going to help you retain employees and parents. Those policies and procedures is what brings your culture and your vision to life. It's what's going to make it solid and give everybody that roadmap they need in order to help you accomplish it. Okay, so that's going to be the plug in your bucket. It's really going to be the way that you can stop the attrition on both staff and families. So that's what you need in order to just like take your, you know, that's another piece of the puzzle to take your business to the next level. Um, that's, and, and one of the things too is that it does need to be documented. There's ways to document it that aren't so difficult. It is not, a, it's, it can be challenging. And uh, for my members, I will give you, well, I've, I've already given you guys my policies and procedures, but we will work on them together also. But uh, that's where like, you know, you can take mine, turn them into your own. But if you're starting from scratch, it is a lot, a lot of work. It has taken me years to write them. And I still add on to them all the time. And whenever I do add on to them, I do share what I add to my members. So the way I've actually done it is every time something came up at one, when, well, when I, let me back up a little bit. When I realized I needed these procedures and when um, my business coach had basically started explaining to me why and showing me in my business specific incidents on why I need these policies and procedures, what I started doing is every time something came up, I would look at, okay, what solution did we try that actually worked? And then I documented it and then it would go into my manual. And so every single thing we did, I would just constantly document. There were times where things had to evolve, right? We had to like, okay, this procedure we came up with, that one didn't work. But now one of my staff members tried this, it worked so much better. Okay, that's our new procedure for this incident, right? Whether it's like a parent picking up late or any kind of, you know, issue or a child, um, you know, maybe a pre k -er that keeps having accidents. Things like that. Uh, there, you know, once you find that solution that works, it becomes a procedure. So those building blocks can take years, years to build. And COVID is a great example, right? Where it's kind of a never-ending process because now we had to just make up whole new procedures thanks to COVID, which I do think a lot of them will be in place permanently. I really, I do think a lot of this is going to just, yeah, and it's a good thing. I actually think a lot of it is a really, really good thing. So that's pretty much like how I started with it, but it has taken me years to come up with them, to refine them and to just really find systems and procedures that work. And human nature, you guys, is human nature. I mean, at, from a neurological perspective, the brain, we all develop the same way, although we have different temperaments and different personalities. Our child, you know, like just development, whether you're an adult or a child, it's the same. And that's why policies and procedures work across the board from center to center to center, because you're, you're going to find, if I find a successful way to deal with biting, 
it's gonna work for you, right? And is it gonna work on 100% of the children? No, because that's just how humans are. But 90% of the time it's gonna work. So that is where the procedures and policies just become so, so, so important. So that's pretty much what I have for you guys today. Again, if um, I, you are interested in having a consultation with me, I am opening up some spaces tomorrow. Send me a message and let me know. I will be having um, opening times up where I can speak to you guys if you're interested in becoming a member or joining my coaching program. Um, I'm kind of stepping away from the one-on-one -on -one coaching and leaning more towards the membership I, group. I really enjoy working with the group. And I really find that there's a lot of great uh, information that comes from the other owners in the group, right? When you've got a collective of owners that we meet twice a week together with, it, just the information that we can come up with and just the knowledge you can gain is really cool. And, and a lot of my members, they have some great insight too. They've got some great ideas and insight. And it's I really love and get excited when I see like one owner who has a little bit more experience like just, you know, when it was like if one owner comes up with a problem and another one is like, hey, I've dealt with that and this is what you really need to focus on and do this, 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 and then it works. So it's just become a, a really cool cohort of owners that can work together to solve problems and come up with solutions to a lot of different problems. So, and like I was telling you guys um, yesterday, or, or maybe it was the day before yesterday, and for directors, my director does actually also coach. She does do it on more of a one-on-one -on -one basis, but we are talking about having her start her own cohort of directors, uh, but that's probably more in the future. So if you do want to schedule a, a time with me, just let me know, send me a message. I'm open to doing consultations tomorrow and Saturday over the phone. We can just chat and I can let you know more about my program and if you're interested in joining us. So I'm going to sign off for tonight. I actually am meeting with my members in 10 minutes for my open office hours. So I will talk to all of you guys tomorrow when we talk about high quality standards. And tomorrow, my director Brandy is going to be on with me. And her and I are going to basically have a uh, conversation about this because Brandy has actually been at Zoo and Around before me. When I bought Zoo and Around, she was already working there. So um, that's where Brandy and I are going to talk about like the quality before and after. So from like from one owner to another and how it's just progressed over time. She's going to jump on and talk to you guys about that with me. We'll just have a conversation about it. So I hope everybody has a great evening. I will see you guys tomorrow.